All right, I think we can start now. Welcome everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today is a CNCF webinar, What's New in Kubernetes 1.17. My name is David Mackay. I was the lead on the communications team. And I'd like to welcome our Enhances lead, Mr. Bob Killen, and our release lead, Guinevere Sender. So thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items. So first, there is no speaking during this webinar. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will try and get to as many of those questions throughout the webinar and cover off anything we can at the end as well. So ask them as we go and we'll do our best to get that covered. This is an official webinar of the CNCF. So because of that, we are subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please do not add anything to the Q&A or the chat box that would be in violation of that code of conduct. So please be respectful of each other and of the panelists. And today we're going to get started. So I'll hand over to Bob. Kick this off actually with uh, Gwyn. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good day, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, may I introduce you to Kubernetes 117 with the subtitle of the chillest release, um, because we only have one holiday season release a year, and Q4 is it. Um, with that, we have our uh, fantastic capybara mascot, who is um, one of the chillest animals of in existence, and I got the fantastic Allison Dowdney and um, her partner Tyler to uh, do a really cool logo for us. So she's extremely talented, and I'm so excited she um, made this artwork for us. Can we do the next slide? All right. Um, David, did you want to go over the agenda? Of course. So We've each selected one feature that we're really happy with from the 1.17 release. We're going to talk about the stability changes that have happened in this release, moving on to snapshot and restore volume support, ending with topology aware routing. After that, we will travel through all of the other SIG updates with the 1.17 release, followed again by the Q&A at the end. Okay, this is where I'll uh, kick in and take over for a little bit. For this release, we had 22 total enhancements. Uh, that's much less than we've had in previous releases, but we sort of see this cyclical nature where, you know, towards the end of the year, fewer and fewer uh, enhancements, especially with the holidays and the shorter cycle, will make it in there. But they make up for it in the beginning. You know, we'll, we'll probably have significantly more for uh, the 118 release. Of those, we had 14 that were going to stable or GA. Um, and most of those are like smaller feature things that just help the, the project as a whole. They, are, they aren't like necessarily huge features. Uh, four that were graduating to beta and four that were new as alpha. Um, yeah, so I think um, I'm going to address one of the biggest themes that was part of this release, um, a stability release. Really? Um, yes, really. In fact, this is something that uh, SIG release has been tossing around for quite a while. Hey, maybe especially given the fact that there are a fair number of folks who are, you know, concerned with the overall stability and the, uh, the quickness with which the project is moving, um, that it might actually make sense to have one release a year be dedicated to just making sure that the project is stable, that all features are moving forward, becoming more usable and becoming more stable. Um, but it never really quite became reality. And that has sort of been true for this release as well, but it kind of shook out naturally that as Bob already mentioned, most of our features are graduating either from alpha to beta or from beta to stable. Um, 
we are hoping that this will uh, turn into a real formal uh, stability release going forward. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's generally the direction that we're hoping that we're hoping this will take. So of the 22, um, 14 went to stable. Uh, we'll dive right in and cover two of them uh, here in a sec. But for a quick rundown, um, the ones that were promoted were taint node by the condition, configurable pod process namespace sharing, scheduled daemon set pods by the cube scheduler, dynamic maximum volume count, community CSI topology support, um, environment variable expansion subpath mount, defaulting of custom resources. Uh, if you are here for the 116 release, that might actually look familiar. Uh, that one was sort of a second part, uh, second half of one that went, went to stable in the last release. Um, move the frequency of the kubelet heartbeats to the new lease API, break apart the Kubernetes test tarball, um, watch bookmark uh, support, behavior driven conformance testing, finalizer prediction, or protection for service load balancers, uh, and a important little thing of avoiding serializing the same object uh, independently for every watcher. So that I will dive into sort of our first big uh, featured enhancement, snapshot and restore volume support. So this is a, oh, I'm gonna report that my audio is breaking up. Can you hear me okay? Okay, cool. Uh, this is a beta feature. It was actually introduced as alpha in uh, Kubernetes 1.12. And the, during the alpha, it actually got like rewritten and from the gr uh, ground up twice. And it's now uh, moving to beta. So many more people get a chance to actually use it. So Kubernetes itself has proven to be like a great abstraction for describing workloads programmatically. Um, however, this has been a bit more difficult with uh, the array of options for managing stateful data. Um, many of the storage drivers out there uh, actually provide some level of like snapshot and, or backup mechanism. So like, you know, when you're working in AWS or Google or something like that, you can take a snapshot of a volume and, and possibly restore it um, later. But there hasn't been any sort of like integration with Kubernetes itself. So you've sort of had to manage that sort of thing out of band. And what this enhancement does is actually brings those primitives uh, back into Kubernetes. So you no longer necessarily have to, um, you know, go to like another console or something like that to script that backup and restore. Um, now, to, just to make something clear, is you can't use this directly out of the box with the 117 cluster. It requires a bit more plumbing and the uh, installation of the external snapshot controller. Uh, this is sort of similar how you would install uh, any sort of CSI based storage driver. And uh, you'll probably be able to expect a lot of the cloud providers to just do this automatically for you. <clears throat> so the external snapshot controller adds a few new CRDs, uh, but the two big ones are the volume snapshot class and volume snapshot. The volume snapshot class is sort of similar to a storage class. It defines which CSI driver is used, how the snapshots are made, and their retention policy. Um, and then the volume snapshot itself is sort of an instance of the volume snapshot class for a provided persistent volume. And this might be a lot to take in, but if this is something that, you're, that is of interest to you, I highly encourage you to check out the blog post link at the bottom. Uh, it came out, I think it was December 9th, and it does a really good job of summarizing uh, all the functionality with this and how to use it yourself. Next is topology aware routing of services. And this is a alpha feature, which means it must manually be enabled if you want to use it. Um, but currently when you use a Kubernetes service, it will sort of map to random pods within a cluster. And this isn't you know, necessarily ideal for a number of reasons. Let's say you have a, a pod that's serving that service that's like right next to another pod that's requesting it. Why go out to like another host or something like that? Um, when you don't necessarily need to. So what a topology routing of services does is it 
allows you to specify sort of a list of preferences um, uh, via a uh, new keyword of topology keys. So you can say like, you know, if it shares the same, if it's on the same host, go to that one. If it's not on the same host, prefer one that's in the same zone. If it's not in the same zone, prefer going to one that's in the same region. And if none of those are true, go to any of them. And that way that should, you know, minimize the latency and sort of randomness that you can sort of see uh, when spinning up a service. So uh, if you don't mind me interjecting there, Bob, we do have a question on the routing. So Mark is asking, can you require routing? I.e., can you go through another layer before it hits a service? Um, it's essentially the, as, as far as I know, when it comes to the, how it works, is it just changes the like IP tables rules in the order in which it's, it's hitting it. Um, I don't know if that, directly answers your question? Well, we can follow up after in the chat. That's fine, thank you. Okay. okay. So that I will kick over to SIG updates. And we will start with API machinery. So touching on what was said before, um, this enhancement was sort of two separate ones, pruning and defaulting. Uh, pruning was, was promoted to GA uh, and defaulting was promoted to beta in the 116 release. This wraps it up by bringing defaulting to stable in the 117 release. So uh, CRDR custom resource definition, um, they're used, they're like sort of user created extensions of Kubernetes and you wind up sort of registering them as their own API, job, uh, uh, API objects, and they will have their own like API version in kind. Uh, so before defaulting was possible, users had to sort of um, provide a value for like every field in a CRD that you were, you were adding, or the developer had to bake in some extra logic by means of like a mutating admission webhook to uh, provide some defaults. And managing this uh, actually became quite a bit more complicated when you start thinking about like having to handle the various like upgrade downgrade conditions uh, where you might add or remove a new field. And so now with the defaulting being sort of baked in by default, um, this issue is, is, is mostly gone and you can now just easily provide defaults in your own CRD spec. Uh, the big thing is, is that to do that, you must use the, AP, the new um, uh, API version, API extensions.case.io slash v, uh, v1. Uh, you can follow the link to sort of defaulting uh, once this presentation is published to read a bit more about that. Because of defaulting was like, because defaulting is such a big thing, I, I honestly expect that 117 will become a minimum requirement for a lot of CRDs and applications going forward. So there, this one and the next one um, sort of work together uh, and they aren't really user facing, but it's uh, watch bookmarks and this uh, improves the performance of the Cube API server. So when a client uh, initiates a watch, and by client, I mean a programmatic client. So something built with like client go or one of the Python libraries, something like that. Um, and they're watching a set of objects to get notified when something changes. Uh, it gets a list with a resource version number and that maps to sort of a set of changes or diffs from the previous version or previous revision. And if the client happens to disconnect and tries to reestablish that watch, uh, the Cube API server and client would have to sort of play back all the resource versions uh, to then get back to where it was. And this caused unnecessary load on the server, especially if you consider you might have a whole slew of things watching those objects. And it could just cascade into a, honestly, a bit of a nightmare. So now you can actually sort of like 
bookmark where it was. And that way when it reestablishes the connection, it doesn't have to go back and, and replay all those changes. It can just sort of like pick up where it left off. Now the less object serialization. Um, so if you have multiple watches watching the same set of things previously, uh, for each client, the Cube API server would have to like serialize that object uh, for each one. Now there's a little bit of like caching in play. So if you have multiple things watching the same thing and they'd be notified of the same sort of updates, uh, they'd be cached. And this uh, we saw like significant problems um, with the like scalability tests where we'd go up to like 5,000 nodes where this would start to cause some performance issues. But after these changes, there's now a general 5% uh, improvement in CPU usage and a 15% uh, less uh, memory used when you're dealing in the scenario where you're having um, multiple watchers watching the same thing. We'll kick off to uh, architecture now. So behavior-driven conformance testing. This is a non-traditional uh, enhancement, um, but it's sort of a larger plan where we've agreed to tackle some uh, better like conformance testing project-wide. So essentially, this is defining how our conformance tests should be built and documented. Right now, there isn't a sort of single ex like explicit list of behaviors or source of truth out there. Uh, these are scattered amongst design docs, enhancement proposals, user docs, and a subset of the E2E tests, as well as the code itself. Um, so this makes it like near impossible to identify uh, if the conformance suite uh, provides a meaningful test for a cluster's operation. And this this cap actually went like right to stable. Uh, by ex, like, it was just merely deciding the plan on how this is going to be tackled. Um, so if conformance is something that interests you, I would highly recommend um, following the links and reaching out uh, to the teams working on this under SIG architecture. Um, and, you know, any help is greatly appreciated. This last one is the removal of the project-wide usage of the node role labels. This might impact people. Um, so this was actually sort of an accident over time. The node role labels, node-role.kubernetes.io slash star, the node role namespace, was not intended for widespread use by the project itself. Uh, but several things actually started referencing it. Um, these were introduced by kubeadm to help them manage the provisioning and manage the life cycle of the kubeadm provision nodes um, and and they were not intended for use beyond that however like and this is sorry this is this is because there are many sort of like tools and provisioners that are not kubeadm based which means you know if nodes are missing those labels and certain things would probably have issues uh, if they, they try and reference them. Um, and certain parts of the project itself, uh, if I recall correctly, the, there was a, a service load balancer and a few E2E tests that were referencing them. But because they were referencing that, that means like they wouldn't function in any sort of conforming cluster that wasn't provisioned by Cubidium. So it's been decided that uh, these labels will stop being used project-wide they may continue to be used by kubeadm, but they uh, may not be used for any conformance related uh, activities or tests. And this CAP simply outlines the plan to start the removal and deprecate them uh, from the other places in the project. Kick over to cloud provider with a, another fun label thing. So for a, uh, quite some time now, um, we've had the beta labels used by the cloud provider to sort of signify, you know, what instance type it is, what zone or region it is. Um, and it's, it's time to bring those to GA. So 
as you can see in the list here, um, like failure dash domain dot beta dot io slash zone will become uh, topology dot io slash zone and so on for the other ones. And the general deprecation plan for these is both labels will be applied to nodes uh, through the 1.20 release. And in 1.21, they'll stop being referenced or applying them, but they will not remove them from objects that already have them applied. If you are relying on these things, I would encourage you to check out this cap and think about you know, updating uh, any, anything that you have that might reference them. That was only one for the cloud provider this time. And we'll go right to uh, cluster lifecycle. Uh, this is a really short one, honestly. Uh, structured output from kubeADM. So as kubeADM is sort of becoming the underlying substrate or underlying tool for many other things, it'd be really nice to actually have like machine consumable logs or other things that can be bubbled up easily or parsed easily. So this is adding um, essentially kubeadm logs that can uh, be outputted in like JSON instead of just simply unbuffered text. Now it's time for some of the fun stuff. Network, and we're back to uh, topology aware routing of services. I covered this a little bit more in detail earlier, but essentially, um, you can set a predefined list of preferences via the topology keys parameter and service definition, and that will be the sort of preferred way services or pods will, will services will route uh, to items. Next is an interesting one. So the IPv4, IPv6 dual stack support uh, was graduated to alpha in the 116 release. Uh, however, since there has been a significant amount of effort across many parts of the project, uh, we are continuing to track it in this release. Uh, anytime there's very large changes like this, where um, you know tests and other things that impact other parts of the project might be updated, uh, we opt to track it. It just means it's not graduating, but we track it as an enhancement. So some of the major changes that happened with the IPv4, IPv6 dual stack um, enhancement is uh, dual stack support was added to the cube proxy in IP tables mode, um, as well as support for dual stack in the downward API. So now if you're doing a reference uh, with the downward API, you'll have both the IPv4 and IPv6 address and they're separated by a comma. Um, the other thing were some changes made to the cube controller manager, where before when you had to specify the like node seeder max size and the configuration parameter, um, like it, it only had one option. Now you can actually specify it for both IPv4 and IPv6 via the like dash dash node uh, dash seeder dash mask size dash IPv4 and dash dash node seeder mask size IPv6. Um, and those, can strictly only be used in dual stack mode. The other thing with sort of all this effort going on, right now the plan is for them to push to beta in 1.18, which means that clusters will fully support uh, dual stack mode sort of out of the gate. Next is the new endpoint API or endpoint slice. Um, you may have heard of this just around a little bit or scattered all over the place. Uh, this is sort of the long-term replacement for the current uh, core V1 end endpoints API. Uh, the current API actually has a lot of performance and scalability problems um, for that like impact multiple sort of components of the control plane. The sort of gist of it is if you, instead of like recomputing an entire list of endpoints and notifying all the watchers when one is updated, uh, they are now sort of broken down into groups, I believe of 100, and only the group that had an updated endpoint will be updated, you know, recomputed and updated. And 
you can like small clusters didn't like have too many problems with this in the past, but once you got to very, very large clusters with potentially hundreds of thousands of pods, uh, it becomes a significant performance problem. And you can imagine soon with, you know, potential for pods to have two endpoints, IPv4 and IPv6, that will be magnified. Endpoint slice has actually been like a requirement before um, IPv4, IPv6 dual stack mode could be supported. Another fun one, uh, finalizing protection for service load balancers. So service type load balancer requires um, Kubernetes and an external entity, usually a cloud provider, to work together to ensure the proper management of their lifecycle. Um, so in the past, there have been a couple conditions where it, the Kubernetes service could be deleted before the actual external load balancer was, was uh, deleted. So if you can imagine, you, know, you deleted that, but you still have an AWS load balancer provision, that's, that's not so great. So now essentially the deletion of the service will be blocking until the external load balancer is removed. Um, functionally, this enhancement hasn't changed too much since uh, alpha, outside of being flipped on by default. It's just been sort of like closely watched to make sure uh, like the, the CI can soak and there, we haven't seen any sort of problems with it. That will move on to uh, Node. So configurable pod process namespace sharing. Um, so the default container behavior, and this is the same thing when you're like, you know, working with Docker locally or anything like that, is that each container will exist and run in its own uh, process ID namespace with the entry point process serving as PID1. So when you're in a pod and you have multiple containers in there, they, they, like, they can't see each other's processes. There have been certain ways to do it in the past, but like it's, it's been a little hacky. Um, now with um, share process namespace enabled, you can actually remove that boundary and let them share one sort of PID namespace. So this might seem like it removes some of the inherent security or isolation mechanisms that we see with containers, uh, but it also opens the door to sort of more complex workflows and enables things like a debug container being attached to another container where you might have a singular going binary. Um, I also know like several groups are looking into this as a means for better CI runners. So this means that you could have your sidecar container sort of function as the init and that manages the job execution in another container and the, with, with the various like build dependencies. It also means that like that container could perform other actions uh, say when the main uh, container, main process that it was watching terminated, it could do some cleanup actions before fully terminating the pod. move the uh, frequency of the Kiblet Heartbeats to Lease API. So this is another backend thing that uh, end users generally won't interact too much with, uh, but it will serve, for, uh, serve both as a performance boost and remove some of the scalability limits encountered with clusters, clusters with more than 2000 nodes. So on an interval, Kubelet will check back in and update sort of its records with a bunch of information about the current state of the node. Um, this includes things like what images it has on there, what volumes are mounted, as well as a slew of other things. And uh, these individual updates can be like uh, upwards of 15 kilobytes in size for a single update. And when you think about it, that's a lot for just a you know, simple node status. So now you multiply that by a few thousand nodes and those nodes checking in every 40 seconds you can start to get an idea of the load in which that puts on both the API server and like the backing authority database. So now instead uh, of including like that full update, there will be a much smaller update as a sort of ready signal that is used as the node lease object. And then a full update will be sent on a much sort of longer interval or if there's any recognized meaningful change. And 
the biggest thing that you will actually probably see as most end users is if you use kubectl and like look at the namespaces, you will see a new name, system namespace called cube-node-lease. And this is where all those lease objects are going to exist. So hey, Bob, before we yep. jump into scheduling, we had a question there related to the pod process name sharing. Sure. Uh, is there any security configuration to enable or disable the sharing the process ID or the process table? Um, give me one sec. My slides are frozen for a sec. This is happening earlier. Uh, you have to explicitly enable this on a pod to do it. Um, come on. Oh, this is going is a. Uh, Really going so sorry about sorry about that. That's all right. I mean, I think you've answered that question. Do you think you'd be able to get back to the current slide, or is it proper frozen? I'm trying. <laughs> Let us know if you need one of us to share, and we can advance through the slides for you. Okay, I'm, I might do, do, need to or at least uh, restart the screen share or something. Give me, give me one yeah, sec. Perfect. Should I sing a song just now? <laughs> Maybe some intermission music. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Now we'll dive into scheduling. So the first one is taint node by condition. Um, the Kubernetes at scheduler itself uh, doesn't actually check node conditions. So these are things like, um, I forget the actual like, specific wording, but there's like memory or disk, uh, disk pressure or like uh, out of disk. And that doesn't directly impact uh, scheduling. So instead the node lifecycle controller would automatically set the uh, like no schedule or no execute taints on the node based on those conditions. Um, and see. This has sort, sort of been in place since uh, directly since uh, 112, but now it's just essentially graduating to stable and some other like cleanup uh, things have been done. The, the main reason for doing this via the taints and tolerations is that way a, a cluster admin can sort of actually force a pod to run in a node even under one of those conditions. Next one, the scheduled daemon set pods by cube scheduler. So this one isn't a huge change for a lot of users. Uh, it's, it's already in effect, but the sort of history behind it is that before this was graduated to beta in 112, daemon sets were not scheduled by the Kubernetes scheduler. The daemon set controller actually handled that itself. And this was because it previously caused some weirdness with the scheduler since the like spec dot no name was already present when the daemon set was created. And 
being scheduled separately by this other process was causing some other problems where um, certain things weren't being respected. So this is uh, most notably when nodes are flagged as unschedulable. Now that they are being managed by the cube scheduler, um, all those restrictions, everything like that will, will be handled properly. Okay. Storage is where uh, I think we have four or five. We'll quickly revisit the big one, the snapshot and restore volume support. Um, essentially, you will now be able to manage snapshots and things like that within the cluster. This was covered at the beginning. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one. This is here mostly for completeness sake and there's some useful links at the bottom that you can use to go see the docs on them. We do have a question if you want to take that now. Sure. So Phil asks, does the snapshot controller support scheduled snapshots? Um, I don't believe so, but you could uh, basically set up as a cron job. Perfect. Okay. So dynamic max volume count. Um, so with the various like in-tree volume providers, um, so this is things like the GCP disks, AWS disks, and a few of the others, there were some um, specific hard coding scheduling uh, uh, predicates in there for the maximum number of volumes that could be attached to a node. And this was mostly mapped to the, whatever limits they were for the cloud provider. Uh, let's say for example, in AWS, you were limited to sort of 40 EBS volumes per instance, and you wouldn't, you know, Kubernetes, you wouldn't want something to possibly be scheduled on there where it already has like 40 uh, disks attached and it'd cause a problem. And so by moving to a dynamic design, these various like cluster wide settings or like, you know, hard coded settings uh, have been deprecated and are now tied specifically to like the CSI uh, driver or volume type that are associated with that node itself. So now you can sort of like mix and match if you have happen to have like nodes running different uh, storage drivers. This probably won't matter too much in the you know cloud providers, but if you're bare metal and you have say like Ceph and some of the other ones, uh, that sort of thing can be pretty important. Uh, CSI topology support, uh, as, sort of similar to the um, preferences we saw with the service topology um, preferences. Uh, you can now have um, preferences for scheduling of storage. So you can sort of define, you know, labels and their acceptable values for use in volume placement. Uh, this is very useful for like, if you want to make sure that your pod is consuming storage within a uh, specific, you know, region or zone um, versus an area where you don't necessarily, where you don't have that. Okay. Next is environment variable expansions via subpath mount. Uh, this was introduced almost a year ago in the 114 release and was started to help with some of the legacy workloads where you may, you know, need to write to a specific place on the host. Uh, the intention for this is to sort of work in a combination with the downward API so that you may you say like, for example, uh, pod names within a mount. Um, this came up specifically because if two or more pods running on the same host happen to reference the same host location and start writing to the same file name, they're going to clash and you're not gonna have a good time. Um, so you can work around this by using the sort of subpath directive, um, or subpath uh, expression directive that, that has been introduced. If you tried to use the subpath one previously and it being hard coded, yeah, bad things are gonna happen. It, it, it can enforce uniqueness. So this has been a very large one for the project itself and migrating the entry storage plugins to uh, CSI driver based. Uh, many of the entry 
base volume types that were built before the CSI or container storage interface um, were implemented. Um, there's been a long-term effort to get those out of tree so that they may be managed separately. Uh, but unfortunately, like right now, is sort of this middle ground. This is, has led to having to support support them both in tree and the, as the non-CSI version and out of tree as the CSI version. And as you can imagine, there's been a, a large uh, duplication of effort. So this enhancement is moves to um, aims to move the remaining internal logic out of tree while maintaining the original API compatibility to minimize other code changes. Uh, right now, the plans do some minimal changes in 118 and then push to graduate to stable in 119. Testing, uh, the only one from testing is to break apart the test uh, tarball. This is a, again like another internal facing only cap where previously we had this large Mondo tarball that had the all the testing suites for, for like every platform baked into it. So if you were on you know AMD, ARM, PowerPC, it didn't matter. They were all baked into there. Now they are on their own separate artifact, and it, it's Im improved the, like testing times and testing quite a bit. Sorry. Moving on to Windows. Um, run as username for Windows. So in the 116 release, we saw two very big Windows improvements. Uh, this, the run as username, and a similar enhancement uh, for GMSA, or Group Management Service Account Support. The work in GMSA was allowed to soak for the 117. Oop. I think it might be freaking out again. There we go. So the work for GMSA was allowed to soak in the 117 release and is expected to pick up again with 118. Um, for the most part, this just adds similar functionality to the run as user directive that we see in Linux containers, uh, just for Windows ones. And as this is very sort of tightly scoped with minimal code or API changes, um, from when it was built in alpha, it was moved to beta and turned on by default for the 117 release for Windows containers. That's all the enhancements we had for uh, the 117 release. I, I guess with that, we'll, we can kick over to some of the questions. All right, thank you very much for that, Bob. That was awesome. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll tackle some of the ones from the end that were related to the CSI, seeing as we've just covered that. So yep. the first question we have is the CSI allowed topologies parameter, can it be configured as a default? Um, I believe that it is configured on, let me jump back. Actually jumping back's a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, I think it just broke it again. <laughs> yep. So I believe that is set up on the, Storage class, I'm not 100% certain on that. So anything being uh, provision of that storage class uh, should be in the right, you know, or at least preference should be in the right zone or region. All right, uh, we have one more with regards to CSI. Is, is there an end of life date for the entry storage drivers? What's going to happen if an upstream doesn't participate in the migration? Uh, as it stands, all of them are participating in it, but the it should be like completely, uh, it shouldn't impact end users at all. Uh, the Right now, essentially there's like a shim being built, so that way any requests internally will just essentially use the CSI uh, behind the scenes. The big thing would be like you might need to spin up CSI driver uh, for the specific cloud provider in addition to what you would normally spin up in a new Kubernetes cluster. Okay, okay. The, okay, now we're going all the way back to SIG network. Uh, okay, that's quite a hard question. What I might suggest is you ask that in SIG network on Slack, but I will throw it to Bob in case you're feeling brave. But can you elab uh, elaborate on how the IP rules are changed with regards to the topology of our routine? So when you create a service, um, it 
gives you like you basically have a IP on the uh, IP tables rule on the host uh, that will point to the current you know endpoints um, for a particular service behind the scenes. What this does is it just shuffles it the order of the IPs. If and this is again if if memory serves me correct. All right, next question. As the key topology seems to be a good way, host name and region, can it be enabled by default on each service? Um, you can't so that's do still, it. Yeah, you'd, you'd have to use something like a uh, mutating admission webhook or something like that, so that any time a service is created, automatically add those preferences for you. All right, perfect. All right, we just have a couple more and then we'll have to wrap up. But uh, is there any reason why the deprecation for the node specification of Kubernetes cloud providers, i.e. node.kubernetes.com? I can the, take, Why are we deprecating? I can take that if yeah, you want. Yeah, go for it, um, Yeah, so basically it's, um, as Bob mentioned earlier, there isn't really an official definition of control plane or what makes a control plane node and every cloud provider sort of has their own take on it. Um, so in order to avoid having actual internal dependencies on these specific labels, um, we are just, it, it's basically just a cleanup thing um, and to encourage people to create their own labels and their own behaviors. Okay, perfect, thank you. We have another question with regards to the cloud provider labels. When will the node name not be dependent from the cloud provider and move to just being labels? And then in brackets, and unify the host name override option of the kubelet. Anyone got anything to say with that? So I'm, I'm rereading the question. Um, the node name will not be dependent from cloud provider and move these specifically to just the label? I'm, I'm kind of unsure on that question. Um, yeah, again, I think, I think you can use whatever labels you like um, as of right now. So um, again, I think this is mostly just so that we don't encourage internal dependencies on something that is really cloud provider specific. Okay, thank you for that. And the final question is about ingress. With many, with many projects bringing in new primitives essentially for ingress, such as Istio using ingress root, is there going to be any unification of these within the next few versions? Uh, I don't know, but there is a cap for that. But they're discussing it. I can see about digging up the link and dropping it in the... I feel like I need to do the meme picture. All right, so that could be followed up with later. That's great. All right, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Gwen. That was great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. This webinar uh, will be was recorded and will be available online with the slides later today. And um, we look forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. So have a great day. Thank you once again to Bob and Gwen for joining us. And I'll see you later. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thanks for hosting. Thanks, everyone.